Said at his memorial in Congress in 1925, Representatives of 48 states gathered to honor and preserve the memory of the late California Representative Julius Kahn, speaking of his human sympathy, patriotism, and bravery to do what was morally just. But the memory of the great man they spoke so highly of was largely lost to the passage of time. On June 5, 2018, a public resolution was announced to the city and county of San Francisco. It implored, urging the Recreation and Parks Commission to remove the name of Julius Kahn from the playground and to rename the playground to something that recognized the value of immigrants and the multicultural diversity of the city of San Francisco. But how could such a thing be said of an immigrant himself, who was a shining example of what a foreigner could achieve and inspire? What had this man done to become an American, and what had he done to fall so low nearly a hundred years after his death? Julius Kahn was born in Kuppenheim, a small town in what would later become Germany. Born to Jewish parents, his family left his native country when he was five years old. His family, like many immigrants, sought a new beginning in the United States, eventually settling down in San Francisco. In his new home, Julius Kahn grew up to study law and was admitted to the bar in 1894. In 1899, Julius Kahn was elected to serve the land he immigrated to as California State Representative. At the turn of the 19th century, business was booming in the Victorian port town of San Francisco. With an increasing population, robust trade, and merchants growing richer by the day, the city on the bay was a valuable asset to a thriving nation. From Knob Hill's mansions to the grandeur of the city's upper class, the wages of trade were more than visible to any new arrival. But beneath the bustle and business of bowler hats, there was a tense political climate of fear and rage. Staying true to its gold rush era past, very few got rich from San Francisco's trade, for the population was made primarily of workers. The city's local factories often supplied goods that would be shipped all throughout the world. In return for the often taxing labor making them rich, merchants paid their workers steady wages for their efforts. But in trade, there is always more money to be made, and the merchants of San Francisco had come across a windfall, or rather, it came to them. Immigration had been part of California's history since the state was first acquired by the United States in 1850, and with the gold rush, people came from all over the world to try to get rich off the legend of gold. The thought of California was enticing to many people from places such as Ireland, Italy, England, Australia, and most important to this story, China. The relationship between Americans and the Chinese in California had always been a contentious one, yet white workers took solace in the fact that Chinese immigrants were usually sequestered to jobs as cooks, cleaners, and laundrymen. Though these roles had been the norm, in the year 1900, looking for any way to turn a profit, merchants would hardly turn up their noses at the prospect of cheap labor. Fearing that not only their jobs, but their place in society was being usurped by Chinese immigrants, white workers rioted, and thus a panic gripped San Francisco. In truth, Chinese workers were overworked, poor, and incapable of attaining the same rights as their white counterparts. Believed to be incapable of assimilating, they were denied citizenship, deeming them forever outsiders. Yet to an alarmed public, the Chinese were now demonized beyond many other minority groups in 1900 San Francisco. Rumors spread that they were harbingers of disease, crime, and all manners of vice. But soon, a new fear arose. A belief that Chinese workers were not just after jobs, but plotting to overtake the United States' thriving West. It was no longer a threat to workers, but America as a whole. The panic was dubbed the Yellow Peril, and its wrath no longer extended to just Chinese populations, for it now included all of Asia. The native sons of the Golden West wrote on the subject, The b have future race plans for a hundred years, and those plans include the acquisition of California and the West Coast for Japan. We should not only make it impossible for them to get a stronger foothold here, but forces them back to where God Almighty intended they should be kept, in Asia. For the security of jobs, protection of the public, and defense of the nation, California looked to a leader who knew what was at stake. They looked to an educated Jewish man who had recently passed the bar. They looked to Julius Kahn and elected him to the House of Representatives in 1899. Praised for his strategic military action in World War I, the battle he was determined to win did not come from over the Atlantic. Rather, he believed it descended from the Pacific. In the House of Representatives, he proposed a bill largely forgotten, but would pave the way for the infamous Chinese Exclusion Act. This bill was the Kahn Bill, named for its champion and introduced to Congress in 1913. Built on the racial tensions between white and Chinese workers, Kahn galvanized the country's attitudes towards Asian immigrants to further his agenda. In an effort to get the bill passed, Kahn stated, 
It is my deliberate opinion that the Chinese are morally the most debased people on the face of the earth. Forms of vice in which other countries are barely named are in China so common they excite no comment from the natives. Their depths of depravity are so shocking and horrible that their character cannot even be hinted. Khan's words were the embodiment of the yellow peril, and he himself was deemed a savior for California's white workers. Though the Khan bill acted specifically to impede Chinese immigration, Khan's hatred extended to all people from Asian countries. Speaking of Japanese immigrants, he said, the people of California regard these Japanese with greater abhorrence, I even with greater fear, than they did the from China. We feel that the former have all the vices of the Chinese with none of their virtues. Using his skill as an orator, Khan frightened an entire nation with his tales. Because of Khan's actions, for the first time in the United States history, foreign citizens would be denied access to the land of promise not because of their politics, record, or relations, but because of their race. Since its beginning in 1926, the park and playground honoring the late Khan was frequented by many San Franciscans, and through the century, both the senator and his impact was forgotten by the city he swore to protect. Until 2018. In June, San Francisco Supervisor Norman Yee introduced a resolution to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Its overview read, a resolution urging the Recreation and Parks Commission to remove the name of Julius Kahn from the playground, and to rename the playground to recognize the value of immigrants and multicultural diversity to the city of San Francisco. Documenting Kahn's role in exclusion, the Damon Report not only detailed Kahn's racist words and actions, but also urged Kahn's name to be stripped from the park entirely. With the passing of the resolution, there came a renewed interest in Julius Kahn and the past he represents. After being forgotten for so long, what the resolution brought to light was suddenly being reported on by local news outlets and examined by affected organizations. The president of the Chinese Historical Society, Hoi Zia, stated in response to the order, The fact is, history matters. The name and places should reflect the city as it is now. Julius Kahn was anti-immigrant. It was decided that the renaming of the park would be led by Commissioner Alan Lowe, Commissioner Lowe first learned about Khan during the renaming of Justin Herman Plaza, named for a racist classist former San Francisco official. When Commissioner Lowe helped out the renaming, General Manager Phil Ginsburg said to him, If you think Justin Herman was bad, just look at Julius Khan. Lowe's work stemmed from the public sentiment towards Justin Herman Plaza, and how communities all over the country were calling for controversial monuments to be removed or renamed. Through historical research, organizing a broad-based coalition, and getting public input, Commissioner Lowe hopes for the park name to reflect the ideals of the community who are helping rename it. Though the park is set to be renamed, many believe the story of Khan and his actions should never be forgotten, as law professor and immigration lawyer Bill Hain agrees. When asked on why it is important to remember the past, he stated, I think that we really can learn from history, and that if we forget what happened in the past, this is very much a cliche, we, we are doomed to repeat it. And um, when we remember historical events that are shameful, it's, uh, it, it stops us from doing similar or analogous things again and so uh, it's very important for us to remember the dark side of San Francisco history. The park takes a personal interest for me because it contained my childhood playground. As a six-year-old the only thing that mattered were climbing structures and swings but as I grew older I took a great interest in history and was fascinated by the rich past of San Francisco. In my sophomore year of high school I was researching the Chinese Exclusion Act and I came across the name Julius Kahn. I thought it odd, but I had not connected the dots until I learned that groups were trying to get the bill passed to have it renamed. What researching this topic reminded me is that the past must be remembered to honor those we believe to be deserving of respect. History may be dark, but only through its examination can we see the modern light.